There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. Let's open the Word of God together in the New Testament to the book of 2 Corinthians. Would you find 2 Corinthians in your Bible? You know, when I study 1 and 2 Corinthians, uh, I, I'm always struck by the fact that God did so many amazing things in a church that was so deeply carnal. And yet, the shocking thing is not just that the Lord did that for them, but hallelujah, the Lord does that for us. God did not put the letters of 1 and 2 Corinthians in the Bible to show you their fleshliness. He put them in the Bible to show you your fleshliness. Isn't it easy to spot somebody else's sin? I mean, I'm telling you now, I can spot your sin at 100 yards and tell you all about it. But I'm blind many times to my own. That's why, that's why you need a mirror. How many of you looked in a mirror this morning before you left the house? Be honest, how many of you looked in the mirror more than once? How many of you have already looked in the mirror since you've been on this property? Yeah, honesty is good for us, isn't it? May I tell you, the Word of God is the mirror, meaning that it's not only a lens on God, it is that, but it is a mirror on us. So when you look in the Word, when you look in a passage like the letters to the church at Corinth, you're not looking at them, you're looking for what God wants to say to you. Would you just breathe a prayer right now to God, Lord, speak to me. Lord, show me me. Show me my need. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We'll read a few verses here together. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now let's just stop right there for a second. That's an interesting phrase, we do you to wit. (laughs) That doesn't sound like something we would say, does it? It literally means, I want you to know this. Did you know there's things in the Word of God God wants us to know? Do you want to know what God wants you to know? And that's why we read the Word. That's why we study the Word. We do you to wit of grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. There are, in fact, three churches in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. First, there's the church at Macedonia. Second, there is the church at Corinth. And third... There is the church at Weatherford, Texas. And don't miss what I just said to you. When you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, this is fascinating, but he gives an example. The example is the churches at Macedonia. He gives an exhortation. The exhortation is given to the church at Corinth, but the example and the exhortation are given so that our local church will become everything God wants this church to be. See, this is not your church. We like to say, that's my church, my church. And I understand the possessive uh, use of that. We belong and they belong to us. And uh, how many of you are glad you got a church home? Yes. But it's not your church to control. It's not your church to build. This is not your church. This is not my church. This is not the pastor's church. This is Christ's church. He's building his church, and he knows exactly what he wants his church to look like, and that's why these individual churches in the New Testament are shown to us so there'll be models, sometimes negative, don't do this, sometimes positive, do this, but the Lord says this is what they want the church to look like. Keep reading. Look at verse number 2. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. Let me just ask you a question. If you only read the first part of that, wouldn't you think those poor, pitiful people? 
These sound like the most miserable saps that ever lived. Look at it. A great trial of affliction. Look at the next phrase. The abundance of their joy. <laughs> How about this one? Their deep poverty. Sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? No, no, keep reading. Paul Harvey said, here's the rest of the story. Abounded under the riches of their liberality. I love this. Dr. Robertson used to say, two men behind prison bars, one looked at the mud, the other the stars. So on one hand, you got reality, and the reality is that life is difficult, problems. Did you know everybody's having a hard time with something? Everybody. Everybody you meet is having a hard time with something. Uh, maybe your issue is financial today, but everybody's not having financial problems, uh, but you might be. But the person that's not having financial problems, they're having physical problems. And the person whose body is healthy, their family is not. I'm just saying everybody is dealing with something. And you can concentrate on that. You can fixate on that. You can get consumed with that. You can let that define your life. Or you can let that be the garden in which God grows every beautiful thing in your life. You can let that issue be the wedge between you and God or you can let it be the prod that drives you to God. And I love the fact that these churches in Macedonia who had great trials of affliction and deep poverty are held up for us as the example church, the, the model church here. It says nothing about their buildings. It says nothing about any of their resources and assets. It says everything about their Christ. Christ was enough in them. Aren't you glad Christ is enough for us? Look at verse 3. For to their power... I bear record, yea, and beyond their power. They were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. In other words, he says, what happened in the churches in Macedonia, I am praying will happen in the church in Corinth. Let, let me I add to that. I'm not adding to Scripture. I'm just saying this is my prayer today. What happened in the churches in Macedonia and what happened in the church in Corinth, I am praying God will do in this local church this week. I'm really praying that. I'm praying that the Spirit of God will take the truth of the Word of God and awaken something in the heart and soul of this church that literally will change our lives and change this world and make a lasting difference for all eternity. Now look, we're not just having another meeting. We didn't just come so we could all see one another. No, no, we came to hear from God and to let God speak to us. In the last uh, seven days, I have been in other churches Last Lord's Day, I was in South Dakota. That's a long ways from Texas, isn't it? And uh, we had uh, glorious, glorious meetings and people come to the Lord. And, and then the last two or three days, I've been in, in Oregon. And look, God has his people everywhere. Did you know that? But here's what, I've, here's what I've come to as an evangelist, moving from place to place and town to town and church to church. It is this. What God does in one meeting is not always the same as what God does in another meeting. You can't compare meetings. You shouldn't compare meetings because the Holy Spirit is working uniquely in every place. But please don't miss this. The, the basic elements of what God does in one church, God wants to do in every church. And so I'm just praying right now, dear Lord, do that in us this week. Now, I told you we're going to kind of pitch our tent here today. So just go ahead and take your Bible ribbon and mark your place or a Bible marker. In fact, uh, I would challenge you to read this entire chapter today, not while I'm teaching right now, but on your own time, all right? This afternoon, read a little bit of it, meditate on it, pray your way through it, and we're going to come back to it. And so I'm not going to cover all of it this morning, 
Uh, but today, I'm going to give you a little something that will help you remember it, a little memory device. Today, I'm going to give you the three ships of stewardship. This is a stewardship conference. Somebody says, what does that mean? I hope when the day's done, you'll know exactly what that means. Uh, but there are, there are three things in this passage that really connect us to our stewardship to God, the three ships of stewardship. You know, when, uh, when Columbus set out in 1492, uh, he had three ships. Anybody remember their names? What are they? The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. You, you, this is an educated audience. That's very good. Uh, when the first colonists set out from London in about uh, 1606, was it? Uh, somewhere in there, and they set out from London uh, on their way to the, to the New World. They, they had three ships. Anybody remember their names? I heard somebody say the Discovery was one of them. Yeah. Uh, there were three of them. In fact, if you go to Jamestown, Yorktown area, they have models of those ships that you can get on. It's, it's fascinating going back in time. What did, the, what did the three ships do in each instance? The three ships carried the people to where they needed to go. Watch this, please. Uh, these, these three ships I'm going to give you today will convey the truth of stewardship to us, but if we get on board, little children, if we board them and follow the Lord's pattern for us, they're going to take us where we need to go. So let's start with one, just one in the Bible study hour. I want you to write this down. Let's mark it in our Bible. It's found in verse 4. When I stop, you say the next word, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the, what's that word, church? So circle the word fellowship in verse number four, and it's not just any fellowship. It is the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. When I say fellowship around a Baptist church, immediately everybody thinks we're getting ready to have food. Isn't that right? Because you can't have fellowship without food. Or in, in a church service, somebody says, we'll have our fellowship time. What that means is everybody's going to walk around, pat each other on the back, and shake hands, and say, our God bless you, and nice to see you, and glad you came. And, and that's good. Nothing wrong with, with the, that in a church service. But I just want you to know that fellowship is bigger than shaking hands, and it is much more than just having a meal together. Fellowship in Scripture is heart level. It's what we have in common in Christ. And I want to talk to you for a few moments about the fellowship of stewardship. Because I think this is very important. Stewardship is a very personal thing, right? It's an individual thing. I'm accountable to God. I'm answerable to the Lord. But you must not forget that our stewardship is in the context of a local New Testament church. That we belong, don't miss this, we belong to something bigger than ourselves. Did you know you can get selfish even about your Christianity? <laughs> that's, that's ironic, isn't it? That in the area where we think ourselves spiritual, our Christian life, we can actually become very selfish thinking it's just all about me. It is never all about us. It is about those God has connected us to. It, it is not just about even this church. It is about what God is up to in this world. And, and look, please, you can't deal with the small issues of stewardship till you get the big picture of stewardship. You've got to see from heaven's perspective, from the throne room, everything looks different. And so where does he begin in this passage? He begins with fellowship. And notice, please, mark it in your Bible. It is the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. What is this? This is our relationship to the church. I wonder, what is your relationship to the Christ church? Uh, do you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Because that's where you've got to start. Who cares that your name is on this church roll if your name is not written down in the Lamb's book of life in heaven? So we must begin there. Somebody say, well, I, I got that preacher. I, I know I've been saved. Wonderful. Have you obeyed the Lord in baptism since you were saved? That's how you come to a local fellowship of believers. Has, has that happened? Well, there are people who have been in church all their life who made some profession of faith, but they never really came out for the Lord and identified with Christ in believers' baptism. Or they got baptized as a baby, but they've never been baptized since they were saved. I'm going to say to you, that's the next step for you. 
And somebody says, well, I, yes, yes, I've been saved and I've been baptized. Wonderful. Are you a member of the local New Testament church where you are currently serving the Lord? Are you a member here? I don't know who the visitors are here today. I'm a visitor. Uh, it's kind of nice to be a guest because you don't know who you're preaching to, so you just preach to everybody and let the Holy Spirit work it out, you know. But I would say this to you. If you're visiting today, you found a wonderful New Testament church. And I'm glad you're here on this special Lord's Day, and I'm glad to get to meet you, but you ought to come back to this church next Sunday. Is next Sunday a normal Sunday? It's a normal Sunday, all right, whatever that means. But you ought to come back next Sunday. You ought to come here. The pastor preach. It's not just the evangelist comes to the town preaching the Bible. You get the word of God from this pulpit every Lord's Day. Aren't you happy about that? So you ought to be a member of a local New Testament church. How many of you are members of this church? Would you raise your hand, please? All right, you're in a great church. Now watch this, please. If you've been saved and baptized and you're a member of this local assembly, now, now you must be thinking like a church member, all right, how does my stewardship affect everything else that's going on in this church? Would you like this church to be everything God wants it to be? When the trumpet sounds and this church now, you're going to stand individually before the Lord at the judgment seat. But when this church's record is read, what would you like it to say? Just that you had church every Sunday? Or you had money in the bank? Or you supported a lot of missionaries? Or you had a program for everybody? What, what was the, the record you'd like to be read in eternity someday. Now, I'm speaking as a church member. I have a church. It's not my church, but I have a, we have a sending church that we're sent out of and accountable to and we're members of. And matter of fact, we have a new pastor. And my dad just uh, retired from the pastorate and uh, we have a new pastor. Been there just a few months and doing a great job, just like the transition you've had here. And I thank God for that. Wonderful to see it move from generation to generation in a local church. By the way, that's the way it's supposed to be done. And we give God the glory for it. But I'm thinking like a church member right now. What do I want from my local church? i tell you one thing. I'm not talking as a preacher. I'm talking as a church member. I want my church to be strong in the Lord and to accomplish everything God gave our church to do. And the only way that's going to happen is if every member of this local assembly says, by the grace of God, I'm going to be the Christian God wants me to be. I'm going to be the church member God wants me to be. I'm going to help this church be everything God founded it to become. Not what can I get out of the church. No, no. You know, people even look at, you know, people shop for churches today. They do. They shop for them. They say, well, I like this, but I don't really like that. And let me use a good West Virginia theological term for that, hogwash. That's ridiculous. They're, 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 look, please, there's no Acts Christianity in that, friends. When we start shopping for churches, what we can get out of it, what we like, what we don't like, we've missed the whole point. I remind you again, this is the Lord's church, and we ought to come to it saying, Lord, help me help this church be everything God wants it to be. It is the fellowship of our stewardship. Let me show you a few things. Let's start in verse number one. Moreover, what's the first way he addresses them in chapter eight? What does he call them? Brethren, write this down. Number one, if you want to understand the fellowship of stewardship first, you have to understand that we are members of the same family. This is family. It's one of the reasons I'm giving this, this particular portion in this Bible study hour because by and large, the people that come to Sunday school, it's the church family. It's the heart and soul of the church. I know who I'm talking to this morning, and I want to say to you, stewardship is family business. My wife is here. We have three children. Oh, by the way, we have our first grandchild since I was with you last. And if you want pictures, I got pictures, let me tell you. You know, I used to watch grandparents and think, you people are nuts. And what's wrong with you? And now I'm right there with them, you know. I love it. Uh, but I've got a family. I love my family. How many of you think it's my business to help take care of my family? How many of you think that? Yes? Sure it is. A man that won't take care of his own family, the Bible says, is worse than an infidel. That's pretty bad, isn't it? So it's, it's family business to take care of the stewardship of our home, our finances, and care for the needs. Well, Put this in the context of the local assembly. When we're talking about the stewardship, it's not just your family. It is God's family we're talking about. Do you know what brethren reminds us of? That we have a father. Because the only way you become brothers or sisters is you have the same papa. I come to churches every week, many times places I don't know. I know some people here, but... Uh, the last few days, a week ago, I was in a place I didn't know anybody. And I love it. 
Or somebody said, isn't that weird? No, not really. I love it. Because I show up, get off an airplane, don't know anybody, and in about 30 minutes, I feel right at home. Somebody said, how's that possible? Different culture, talk different, different food, different, yeah. You know what? We have Jesus in common. We are members of the same family. We have the same wonderful heavenly father. And by the way, we're going to spend eternity together, so we ought to get used to it now. Like we're all going to a big family reunion. Did you know that? It's at the father's house. We're going to be there very shortly. A meal like you've never seen being prepared for us. An eternal home we're going to be in. But don't miss this. You're a part of the family of God now, not just when you go to heaven. And God is your father, and you're part of something bigger than yourself. By the way, James reminds us that every good and every perfect gift comes down from above. From where, church? From the Father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. When you remember and remind yourself that every good thing you have is because your heavenly Father, your perfect Father gave it to you, it will change your whole perspective on the stewardship of life. You and I are members of the same family, and we're fellow heirs with him. See, everybody thinks when you come to stewardship conference, the preacher is going to talk about money, money, money. Isn't that right? That's what people think. The interesting thing is, it's the next chapter that's the money chapter, chapter 9. I'm not going to preach on it this week. Pastor can preach on it. I'm not going to preach on the money chapter. No, no, I'm, I'm preaching on the motive chapter. I'm preaching on the chapter before the chapter. Because if you're going to do the right thing with your money, you need to start by doing the right thing with the eternal riches you have in Christ Jesus. Adrian Rogers said, find out how rich you are, add up everything money cannot buy and death cannot take away. That's pretty good, isn't it? See, the true riches is not what you have in the bank account and not what you spend every week. The true riches is what you have from your heavenly Father because of the perfect Son, Jesus Christ, as a member of the family of God. This is the fellowship of our stewardship. Then there's a second thing. Come down to verse number 2. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy... And their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. So we move from the family in verse number one to the fight in verse number two. And for the record, we're not fighting with each other. We're fighting the devil, fighting the world, fighting the flesh, fighting difficult circumstances. Write this down. Here's our fellowship. We're members of the same family. And number two, we are soldiers in the same fight. There's spiritual warfare going on. Let's just take a survey. May I take a quick survey of this church? How many of you have any conflict, any problem, any burden, any struggle, any concern right now? Would you raise your hand, please? Hold it up big and high, big and high. And the people whose hands aren't raised, they're still asleep, so wake them up, all right? Man that is born a woman is a few days and what? (laughs) Full of it, full of trouble. That's life. But it's not just human life. Spiritually, the nearer you get to God and the closer you get to God's purpose for you, the more pushback you're going to deal with. I have found in traveling that in meetings where the Lord's really going to do something, I fight the devil. Can't explain it to you, but I just, and sometimes I struggle with myself, but that's spiritual warfare too, you see, because everything God ordains, Satan opposes. But don't miss this. We don't serve God after it gets better. We serve the Lord in the middle of all of that. That's what shows the divine provision. Would you write this statement down? Everybody write this statement down, would you please? Don't let your need rob you of your ministry. Did you know there are some people who never ministered to anybody else because all they can see is their own need? This is fascinating to me. But the Macedonian churches had great need, great affliction, and great poverty, but they didn't let that stop them. In fact, in the midst of that need, what did they do? They sent money to the church at Corinth. They sent money to the Apostle Paul's uh, gospel advance work. That's fascinating to me. If you wait till it gets better to serve Jesus, you will never serve Jesus. So frankly, some of us need to stop talking about how bad it is, how tough we have it, how difficult life is. I call them Eeyore Christians. I meet them everywhere I go. Everybody remember Eeyore? We're really getting spiritual now, aren't we? Everything bad, everything on the down note. You know, when we all get together at the judgment seat, 
Now, use a little sanctified imagination for a second. When we all get together at the judgment seat and we're looking at the nail-pierced hands and feet of Jesus, <laughs> and then we look to our right and to our left and we're standing next to the martyrs who were stoned and burned at the stake for their faith, do you really think we're going to talk about what a hard time we had with our culture? I mean, frankly, there's affliction going on. There's persecution going on. There's spiritual challenges at this moment in our world. And you can be so consumed and concerned by that that you miss the divine resources you have in Christ and why God has us here at this moment. It's a privilege to serve God in this generation. God sovereignly chose you to be alive and serving God at this time in this world. I want to tell you on the authority of the word of God, that's a privilege. Stop concentrating on the opposition and the obstacles and missing the opportunity. The great door always swings on the hinges of opposition. Oh, Dr. Bob Jones Sr. was famous for talking about that, the great door and the, and the affliction always going together. Don't miss what God is doing in the midst of your trouble. There's problems in this room. If we had time, and stand and tell us about your problem. Man, we go on and on and on, talk about it, and they're legitimate problems. I'm not trying to minimize the problems. The Lord cares about your need, but I'm simply saying if you get stuck on that and that's what consumes your life, you're going to miss what God wants to do through your life. You'll know how to experience more of the power of God. Be a channel, not a depository. God will put through your life more blessing as you seek to be a blessing to other people. This is the fellowship of our stewardship. We, Yes, we're members of the same family. Hallelujah. But we're also soldiers in the same fight. And I want to tell you something, church. Stewardship works in every situation. In every situation. For example, somebody says, well, you know, we're struggling financially right now, so we just, we really can't give right now. Now hold up just a second, because I want to tell you what, what you're doing at this moment is you're limiting God and saying God only works when there's plenty of money in the bank. I want to remind you, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He can take care of his own children. Don't you limit your stewardship to your situation. So the fellowship of stewardship reminds us that we're members of the same family we are soldiers in the same fight and then a third thing we are recipients of the same fullness there's a key word here I don't know if you noticed it it's found three times in the verses we read I'd like you to mark it because I think it's the great word look at verse number one moreover brethren we do you to wit of the what's that word church I didn't hear you of the what one more time of the what and notice, please, it's the grace of God. Where does it come from? From God. Now, that's important. You'll see why in just a moment. Come to verse 6. Insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same what? Grace also. Look at verse 7. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and all diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this what? Grace also, would you mark it grace, grace, grace? Anybody in here need grace this morning? I'm just curious. Somebody say, well, you need to preach on that in the next hour when, when all the lost people come. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. I need more grace today than I did 42 years ago when I first trusted Jesus. I, I'm telling you, it's like every day I get more acquainted with how much more grace I need. Anybody with me on that? And I'll remind you, he's writing to saved people here. And watch this. We don't all have the same resources. We don't all have the same talents. We don't all have the same gifts. We don't all have the same opportunity. But blessed be Jesus, we all have access to the same grace. Every one of us. The same fullness. Watch this. It's not your fullness. It's his fullness. It's not your resources. It's God's resources. It's not your ability, it's God's ability. Matter of fact, let me show you this. Would you go back up, please, uh, to verse, verse number one? Let me just show you a few things. 
Uh, he says it's the grace of God. You should mark that, the grace of God. Did you know the word used here for grace literally comes from the root word for joy and gladness? That's interesting to me. Because when I think grace, sometimes I get this mental picture like, well, I'm just trying to get through. No. No, this is an abundant grace. This is a joyful grace. This is the gladness of God. It sounds almost like where he said God loves a cheerful giver, doesn't it? So uh, this grace is deeper than what you see. It goes all the way to the heart. Then look at verse number 2. This grace goes further than what you have because the Bible says they had deep poverty. It's not about us. It's about the Lord. Now look at verse number 3. Did you notice this when we read it earlier? They not only gave to their power, they gave, mark this, beyond their power. May I ask, how do you give beyond your ability to give? It's God's ability. How do you give beyond your power? Somebody said, that's not possible. Not naturally, but supernaturally it is. To give beyond your power is to let God give through you. To, to live beyond your level of means, means that you're depending on the Lord to supply. And so this grace is deeper than what you see and further than what you have. And then this grace is bigger than just what you say. Because as you come down through the passage, he talks about their knowledge. Look at verse number 7. He said, you've got faith and you've got utterance and you've got knowledge and you've got diligence. And that sounds like a pretty good list, doesn't it? But he says, I, I want you to experience the grace of God in this way. You know what I've discovered? That spiritual gifts are not the same as spiritual people. Now listen to me very carefully. You may have some spiritual gift. You can sing, you can preach, you can teach, you can play an instrument, you can administrate, you can lead. That's a spiritual gift. But just because a person is operating in a spiritual gift God gave them does not mean they're a spiritual person. In fact, I think sometimes we're, we're using God's spiritual gifts, but we're not really letting the Holy Spirit use us like he wants to because we're depending on what we can do instead of on what God can do. I'm going to tell you what this church needs this week, a fresh dose of the grace of God. Because if we get a glimpse of the grace of God and the greatness of God, it'll take care of the stewardship. You know, that's something I've learned in travel. I don't have to preach on everything. Whew, that's a relief. I don't have to call everything by name. I, I don't have time to address everything. I don't even know every need in this room. And if I did know it, I couldn't address it or fix it. But here's what I know. If I can point us to the Lord and we all have a fresh experience of the grace of our mighty God and remember what we're part of, that truth will meet the deepest needs in every one of our lives. This is the fellowship of our stewardship. Matthew Henry said, the biggest talkers are not always the best doers. And sometimes we got the utterance down, don't we? We got to utterance. How many of you have been around church a while? We all know the religious cliches. We all know them. Let's just get real and transparent for a moment. We all know where to say our amens and God bless you and praying for you, brother, and we all know the religious cliches. I'm asking, where are you at in your own inner man with your own experience of the grace of God? And knowledge, brother, do we have knowledge. I mean, when you stick around church like this for several decades, you get a head full of it. You know who the most arrogant people in most churches are? People that win Bible trivia every time they play. Because they know that already. And especially you come to a stewardship conference and a preacher announces a text and somebody says, we know that chapter already. Well, good, congratulations. Knowing and doing are two different things. Hearers and doers are two different things. Uh, look, not, not anything new this week, but dear God, give us something fresh. A fresh experience of the grace of God, a, a deepened understanding of the truth of the Lord. Knowledge puffs up. You can have a head full of knowledge and a notebook full of sermon notes and a heart empty of the grace of God. And I'll tell you what we need. We need this whole fellowship right here, this whole fellowship to experience in a fresh way the grace of Almighty God and say, you know what, we're a part of something great. 
We are members of the same family. We're soldiers in the same fight, and we're recipients of the same fullness. And if God will help us, we want to be better stewards of the manifold grace of God. We're all connected to each other, and we all have a contribution to make. Amen, church? Let's end with one verse, and it's not here. Go over with me to the end of your New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 4 for just a minute. We'll compare Scripture with Scripture, and we'll use this verse like our exclamation point on our study, all right? I love this. Connect this in your thinking to what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. It's an amazing passage. I wish I had time to study the whole passage. Verse 8, he talks about giving, showing charity. Uh, verse 9, he talks about hospitality without grudging. But here's what's behind it all. Look at verse 10. As every man, does your Bible say every man? Hmm. As every man hath received the gift. Whew. I just want to pause and say, Lord, thank you for the gift. The unspeakable gift through Jesus. What is this? It's the grace of God. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. <laughs> that sounds like the fellowship to me. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I love that word manifold. The many faceted sides of of the grace of God. Look at a diamond with all of its cuts and angles reflecting light in a thousand different directions. You know what that is? That's the grace of God. Reflecting God's goodness and mercy and glory in a thousand different ways. Oh, blessed be our God who has shown us his manifold grace. And we're stewards of that. And where does it begin? It begins right here in our fellowship. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit, and don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.